Okay, hello and welcome to the next in our series of webinars uh, looking at Greece this time. So we're on Discover Greece, um, presented by Maria Mitzi. So hopefully you are already aware um, that we at WSP School London have been running a series of webinars throughout lockdown as we are no longer uh, currently not available to do classroom courses, classroom events. This has been our way of trying to uh, reach out about wine uh, over the last few months. Um, so they've all been free, they've all been recorded. Um, if you want to view any of the recordings, they're available on our website. Um, and yeah, we're uh, excited to bring you another event this evening. Uh, I hope you are too. Um, so that, that's it from me. I will let Maria take over and introduce herself and uh, tell you all about Greece. Thank you, Julia. And, um, uh... Thank you everyone for being with us and uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Maria Mutsu. Uh, I am a WSET alumna, uh, but also I am a, uh, a medic. Uh, I'm a practicing uh, a doctor uh, and a fellow of the earlier um, uh, Higher Education Academy uh, of UK. Now uh, it's been renamed as HE Advance, which is a professional um, a professional body that uh, supports and um, oversees skills in the professional environment and in academia. Uh, so I had training with them and I have been participating in various activities with them and I have done educational um, uh, activities within my profession for staff and medical um, students and uh, trainees. Uh, but the wine is obviously is another activity. Uh, what sort of uh, uh, drew, drew me into wine is quite interesting. And I think um, it's, it's a nice uh, little chat that I would like to have with you. Um, uh, there, it's, it's a three-faceted um, uh, uh, reasoning. Uh, one is exploration of taste. Uh, because I think um, we are becoming uh, extremely visual and technical in our modern life and some senses and some which is uh, simultaneously ways of thinking are being um, a little neglected so um, I think it is a fantastic way to to sort of explore um, taste and explore uh, a certain type of thinking uh, that connects with more sort of um, basic basic needs. Uh, another reason is um, exploration of terroirs, uh, which uh, in effect are very well tuned and very well coordinated ecosystems. So very good terroirs, the ones that give very good wines, are actually very well um, coordinated uh, systems, um, complicated systems by which uh, the soil, uh, the climate, uh, various microorganisms, plants and animals, insects, um, yeasts and so on, they work in very good harmony. And this doesn't happen um, uh, out of the blue. Uh, it's a process of many thousands of years of fine tuning between the different species. Um, so it's interesting to uh, somehow be able to explore these terroirs uh, through an unexpected means, which is wine, as uh, pleasurable as well. But it's very, very interesting uh, to see how such a multitude of elements and factors can have an effect on basically what we eat. Um, I mean, um, Wine is a such, such a fantastic uh, and, and fanciful uh, product. Uh, uh, for Greeks, it's is almost food. Uh, so I would, you know, I, I brought up to consider wine as a food, not that I was uh, fed with wine in my early age, but uh, wine was on the family table uh, every day. It was never missing. It was an important uh, part. Uh, and I think for those communities uh, uh, in which wine has such a central ro role in the table, uh, this understanding of the wine as a food stretches out to sort of put it in 
uh, in the environment and see it as a product of a well-coordinated ecosystem. So the second, the second reason was this exploration of, um, of ecosystems. And the third reason was um, basically the use on the table as a fine complement for, for food and to enhance, obviously, the experience of, of tasting food um, and uh, having the best possible experience, as well as um, uh, having uh, a supplement uh, in the diet that can be quite beneficial. Obviously, uh, we are not advocating uh, exaggeration and um, some um, doctors even, uh, Hippocrates and other people uh, in, in the history of medicine, they have, um, they have commended along the um, positive uh, effect that wine uh, can have in the human body. Uh, see it as a medicine, uh, you should always follow the rules and you should always follow the right dose uh, so you can actually get uh, poisoned through a very good medicine. So just putting, uh, putting uh, a little bit of um, sort of uh, uh, um, a limit there. And then uh, here we are. I have enjoyed very much um, being um, uh, an alumna and being a, being a pupil in the WCT's uh, school. And I would, I would like to share with you things that I have discovered along the way through the WCT, through my own uh, sort of um, uh, journey of exploring Greek wine uh, in depth, visiting uh, those terroirs and speaking to people and um, basically coming to discover some wines that I think they are genuine. Uh, so here we are today. Uh, there will be a little bit of mythology, a little bit of history. Uh, if you see them differently, they are actually merging at one point. Uh, there will be a little bit of um, geography, and then we will focus on the three PDO regions that I have chosen today to showcase, like a little sort of a little journey, a little uh, brief journey throughout Greece. Uh, through three different regions, PDO regions, and three varieties, um, all PDO varieties. Um, and then we will have a chance to taste wines and chat, which will be an important and very, very interesting part. So we are ready to go. Uh, let me see. So um, I don't know how many of you have you been in Greece? Um, it's, I believe it's a, it's a good destination uh, in summer. People. Uh, generally like to go to Greece, uh, whether they have a ch the chance or not. I don't know how many of you, you have been in Greece, uh, but basically uh, Greece is a rocky land uh, that lies in the uh, southeast of Europe. Um, some people think it's a frontier, a uh, geographical frontier for Europe. Uh, it has definitely be a crossroads uh, of civilizations, cultures, melting pot, um, and um, and the words uh, Europe and Asia are actually Greek words. Um, Europe means the wide-faced uh, or the wide-eyed, and in uh, for ancient Greek aesthetic standards, it meant beautiful. Uh, it is the name of a Phoenician princess uh, that um, was taken by by uh, Zeus. Uh, him being uh, converted into a bull and flew over the Aegean. And uh, the, first, um, the first reference of the word Europe appears in, uh, in Homer, in Eliad, uh, and is considered the western border of the Aegean, interestingly. So it brings the idea of the frontier here. Um, and as you may see, uh, on the, on the uh, uh, left hand side, we have uh, the map of modern Greece, uh, which is um, it's a um, uh, a lazy a lazy land uh, in the south and east of uh, Europe, uh, quite mountainous. People think of islands, uh, but actually there are lots of uh, high mountains in Greece. The highest being Olympus, uh, the home of gods. Uh, so you can see that on the north, it's bordered by Albania, North Macedonia, Bulgaria, and Turkey. And on the, uh, on the east, uh, there is the Aegean Sea and Turkey. On the west, there is the Ionian Sea, 
uh, which divide, um, sort of separates Greece from Italy. And in the south, we have the Sea of Crete, excuse me, um, the Sea of Crete. So it is basically uh, lumps of mountains and rocks uh, surrounded by sea. It's a windy uh, country and sunny country, of course. Uh, there is a multitude of soils. Uh, there, has, there is a lot of seismic activity in Greece. I don't know if you're aware of that, uh, which explains the, the big number of islands. Um, and um, so this means also there are uh, streams, uh, under, undersea streams. So it's a very active place geologically uh, as well. Um, so we said sun, wind, um, uh, interesting um, variety of soils. Um, and, and different micro terroirs, which we will come to. And going back in history, uh, I've got a picture, uh, I've got a map from National Geographic of ancient Greece. That was the era of the, of the colonization. So Greeks being um, sailors uh, at heart, uh, they, have, uh, they have organized expeditions and they have tried to basically uh, enlarge uh, the area of um, ex expand, let's say, their civilization, but basically enlarge the area that they could deal with, uh, uh, exchange, um, exchange uh, cultural elements and have trade with. And you can see there that uh, uh, how much a sailor, uh, sort of a group of people, uh, Greeks are, that they always wanted to stay uh, near the, the shore. And, uh, and this actually uh, later on extended on the, on the western part of the Mediterranean and there, are, there have been Greek colonies uh, all along the now French coast and the uh, Iberia, Iberic Peninsula, Nice, um, the French city is named after the Greek word Niki, which means victory. Uh, and so on. So uh, this is very important when we think about the first, not the first, one of the first uh, wine trades that Greeks undertook. Uh, so we'll come back to that. So as we said, uh, there is a variety of terroirs in Greece. There is a variety of um, land relief. Uh, we have mountains, uh, a good number of mountains over uh, 2000 over or near 2000 and over. Uh, the highest mountain of Greece is Olympus, which is near, nearly 3000 meters. Uh, so I think it's 2940, somewhere there. Um, so in the north, uh, the climate uh, is um, continental and inland. It's pretty continental. And you can see beautiful bridges on the left, uh, artisanal bridges. There are lots of them. There are rivers as well. So mountains, rivers. So snow, uh, mountains, rivers to find for, for, the, for the water, sort of the water uh, volumes to find their way to the sea. Uh, nice bridges. We have these rocky islands uh, spread on both seas and three seas, including the south. Um, the middle picture is of Sandorini, just showing one side of the island, pretty naked uh, and marble. Uh, Sandorini is very much lava, but there are different, uh, so it's not uh, only lava. So there is definitely some marble there, as it is in all uh, Cyclades. And there are uh, sulfuric, copper and iron uh, elements in the soil. And on the right, we've got a plain uh, in Amir, which is a valley. Uh, so this is a softer sort of uh, landscape there with vegetation, olive trees, um, orange and lemon orchards, uh, of course, vines, uh, and uh, low vegetation as well, bushes, uh, lots of herbs uh, in Greece. Um, and the climates, uh, they differ as well uh, from place to place. Uh, the, the nice thing uh, in Greece is, as it is such a bumpy and lazy country, you find um, clusters of, um, uh, of ecosystems, uh, very well sort of tuned ecosystems and self-sufficient. Uh, and you find a different climate in all this. So the climate on the coast is Mediterranean. Uh, on the islands and the rockiest and the driest of those islands is Mediterranean, but, but without water, uh, very little or no water. Um, 
And then there is continental climate uh, inland, especially from central Greece uh, and going north. And there is a very cold climate up in the, in the mountains um, and uh, low temperatures. And there are peaks that uh, they are always snow covered in Greece, believe it or not. Uh, people wouldn't believe that, but it's true. Uh, including Olibus plus uh, some, some um, mountain tops uh, in the Pindus range, as well as in Crete. So there, are, there, are, uh, there is one peak, definitely always uh, snow covered in, Greece, in uh, Crete. Uh, so I call this a quasi alpine. Uh, I hope the, um, the environment people are not upset with me <laughs> by doing that. Um, and there is a fantastic biodiversity in Greece. And that is very important when we talk wine, again, believe it or not. Uh, so lots of little herbs um, that they can live with very little arid conditions because of these fine tuned ecosystems, which we have to preserve. Uh, so there's lots of um, thyme, uh, lemon thyme, um, various herbs, um, immortel, you may have heard of it. Um, um, rosemary, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, there are uh, about 6,600 and something unique species in Greece. Uh, 6,000, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong there. Six, around 6,000, um, maybe 300, of which uh, the 5,700 and something are indigenous. Uh, so uh, any loss there is a loss for the humanity. Uh, so it shows how good and how self-sustained uh, this ecosystem is. Um, and then you may have heard of Greek myths. Um, uh, it, they are very uh, elaborate. Uh, they're very intriguing. Um, they, um, the, sort, the core of those myths are, is basically the order in the world, as I guess in many myths uh, all around uh, the world. Uh, with um, gods and cyclops and titans fighting to sort of establish a good order in the world. Uh, you may have heard, I'm sure you know, the 12 Olympian gods. And there was another one, so 12 Olympian gods, six uh, female and six male. And there was a 13th that was uh, admitted in the Olympus, and that was the god of wine, uh, Dionysus. So he didn't belong to the first 12 uh, twelve some pantheon, and there was even a, a hero or semigod or demigod that uh, was raised into a divine position and was also admitted, and that was Hercules. Uh, but he had to go through a lot of trouble uh, in life. Uh, so here we've got uh, uh, Dionysus. Uh, Romans called it uh, called him Bacchus, and what is interesting here, and that sort of. Uh, uh, inclusion in the, in the major sort of um, group of gods, um, it sort of shows, I think, in a very graphic way, how uh, the cultivation of wine came into the Greek territory, uh, possibly from the Aegean Islands in Crete, and became very important part of the, of the Greek culture. Uh, and um, if we sort of read the myth, um, uh, Dionysus was, was, not bo was born in Asia Minor and um, it was actually an imported god. So the cultivation of wine basically came into Greece from the Asia and was incorporated fully uh, with festivals, with worshiping of the god of wine, ascension, uh, ascension into the Olympus, uh, and um, lots of rituals around it. Um, and they, the Greeks even developed secondary gods uh, that they had to do with uh, drinking wine. So wine, as well as olive oil in Greece, they were not just important products, they were sacred products. Uh, and following on, uh, on that basis, on that mythological and cultural basis, uh, uh, there was development of um, of gatherings uh, or in which uh, obviously the preparation of food was um, detailed um, and wine drinking again was slow and detailed and um, there were um, people serving 
uh, the wine that they had a special role. Uh, the, there, was, there were eloquent discussions during that, so you, you're not allowed really to be drunk because you had to discuss uh, with, uh, um, with um, other people participating. Um, so the mythology says that initially it was Ibi, a goddess that was serving nectar and ambrosia to the gods on the left, and she was the matron of the sommeliers of uh, of the people that they were serving wine in the in the symposium and the banquets. Uh, later on, after she she got married, uh, this was passed to Ganymedes on the right, uh, who was a male, um, and um, then he became the official sommelier of the of the gods. Now during the symposium, uh, there were definitely rules depending on the on the. Um, uh, preferences of the people that they were participating. Greeks used to dilute, um, used to have, used to have to be very fond of sweet uh, and concentrated wines, and therefore they used to dilute them with dif different kinds of water, uh, including seawater. So there was a sort of um, uh, there was a maestri as to how you could dilute it uh, to uh, offer the maximum uh, tasting pleasure, uh, the less. Um, of um, uh, of effect uh, in people's ability to to discuss and so on. Um, so we think that perhaps that was um, uh, that was the f uh, a founding sort of point for uh, for um, for sommeliers and the art of serving wine. Uh, and then uh, Greeks were traders and they were transporting wine uh, everywhere in the north in the Black Sea. Uh, in the west, uh, on the coasts of um, uh, Italy, now Italy, France, and Spain, and the north of Africa, and um, they have uh, to to benefit the most. They have classified uh, the wines depending on the region, depending on the quality. Uh, so, superior wines would demand higher prices, and here we can see some amphoras uh, and. These were stacked at the bottom of the sea, of the ships. Uh, the amphoras became obsolete uh, after the invention of barrel by the Romans. Uh, so they are sort of the main transport means of the ancient world. And obviously, uh, there is a very long history, and uh, there are different phases. There are um, there are highs and lows uh, during all these different uh, episodes of history, uh, Greeks have never ceased um, to uh, have to include wine into their daily um, life, uh, uh, being part of uh, the table, uh, of the daily table, um, and being part of the major cultural events as well. Every celebration includes wine, and wine has been used in Holy Communion as well, together with bread. Um, and vine, so vine cultivation has gone uninterrupted for all these um, uh, centuries and millennia. Uh, even uh, during the Ottoman uh, rule, uh, there were special taxes paid to allow people to continue with their um, uh, cultivations, including uh, vine cultivations. And monasteries have played a very important role in, um, in um, continuing wine cultivation as well and winemaking, whereas a big part of the population being too poor to do that was not able to. And there has been a lot of domestic wine production. So farmers in Greece, they were not specialist farmers. They would have a bit of wheat, a bit of um, vine uh, orchard, and they would, households would do their own wines. Um, so that's that's past more or less and we come into the present uh, so today we have chosen uh, three different regions uh, starting and three different terroirs very different so we start from the northwest uh, where uh, the first dot uh, on the top uh, is uh, the area uh, there the PDO area is called Zitsa uh, it's up in the mountains, in the Pindus Mountains. Um, Pindus is a range that comes down uh, from the Alps. Uh, and as you can see, this is a physical map of Greece. So you can see 
that it's quite mountainous and in fact the the longest range is Pindos Oros it says there is a range uh, so it sort of continues really uh, past the, the strait past the sea strait continues onto the Peloponnese and really truly continues onto Crete uh, so there are uh, there is um, uh, underwater um, uh, uh, variation of heights, but is the same sort of line of uh, mountains that continues all the way. And that's why in Crete, we have such tall uh, mountains. Uh, so the first stop is Zitza. It's a Pidio region. The variety, Pidio regions in Greece, just a small here, a parenthesis, uh, how they were developed. Uh, the modern Pidio regions were developed in the early 70s. Um, and uh, they were developed basically uh, on the basis of wine variety. Uh, some video uh, regions were developed on the basis of wine style, um, but mostly um, grape variety. And uh, there are 33 of them, 33 video regions for Greece. Um, so Zitza is the northwest uh, most, furthest. It's a pretty small uh, video region, uh, one of the smallest, um, if not the smallest, uh, with about 2,000 hectares, just a little bit over 2,000 hectares. Um, only three wineries, three professional wineries there, really, really tiny. Uh, the grape variety, the video grape variety, is a wide variety, the bina. The word the bina possibly comes from Latin, uh, from the words de vino which again emphasizes this sort of cultural exchange that the Greek land has been subject to, has been theater of. Um, the second stop will be Nemea, what, the, the largest, uh, the largest video region of Greece. So Nemea is the blue spot on the Peloponnese. Peloponnese is the hunt-like uh, peninsula in the south mainland Greece. Uh, and Nemea is on its on the north part of the uh, of the peninsula, north and east. It's a valley. Uh, uh, it's a valley uh, that um, contains uh, uh, about 45, 44, 45 uh, wineries. Uh, the main grape variety and the video grape variety there is Agiorgitico, the most cultivated red grape of Greece, red grape, uh, and known since ancient times. Uh, actually. Uh, they were there in the ancient times, uh, temples of Ibi. I said that Ibi was the server of ambrosia and nectar to the gods. So they used to worship Ibi there. Uh, the ancient name was uh, uh, Fliusa, and this is where Hercules uh, has performed his first uh, task, uh, the killing of the Nemean lion. The locals call uh, red wine the blood of Hercules. Uh, that's our second stop. And the third stop is Sandorini. Um, very celebrated, um, very sort of um, um, uh, very desired uh, touristic destination. Uh, is, a, is, a unique, is a unique place. Um, it's, um, uh, it's unique in many ways, um, historically. Uh, it, um, uh, it signals the end of the Minoan civilization. You may have heard that there has been, uh, there, is, there is actually a volcano in Sandorini. There is an active volcano in Sandorini. Uh, Sandorini nowadays is formed uh, of four islands, one of which is larger, is the main island, is what we call Sandorini, but there are uh, three smaller islands uh, around it and they, they all form sort of a circle, in the middle of which is the volcano. Uh, the volcano erupted, create, uh, had a huge eruption in around 1600 BC, uh, which uh, created a big earthquake. Uh, this has been sort of felt across the Aegean, uh, including Crete, and has basically uh, brought to soil um, buildings created uh, tides, uh, tsunamis, that has reached the north coast. And even uh, people believe that it was such a major event uh, for the sort of um, the geological order of, of the planet that it has even, on that year, uh, there has been uh, no summer in China, sort of changed the, the succession of seasons. 
uh, and that was a major issue so far away that has caused uh, a change in the dynasties in China. So uh, that volcano eruption has created this big sort of crater uh, in the middle of the sea and this has caused uh, this beautiful sort of cliff, black cliff that we all know, we have seen uh, in pictures of Sandorini, uh, 300 meter and over of a, of a black cliff on the top of which very picturesque, a picturesque um, um, uh, houses uh, uh, lying with beautiful views uh, of the sunset. Um, so that's the volcano uh, there. Uh, which makes basically the soil um, very um, uh, mineral, rocky, arid, uh, plus um, there are other elements there, climatic elements as we will see, strong winds that sort of define the terror of Sandorini. So that's, these are the three uh, we are going to now see and we are moving on to the first one. Uh, up in the north uh, west, uh, 650 to 700 meters of altitude, uh, we have uh, the uh, vineyards of Debina. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, red wine there and red grape varieties, but the majority is white uh, and it's planted with Debina. Uh, so Debina is on the left, uh, is relatively resistant, it's a wet, um, it's a wet uh, sort of uh, climate there. Uh, the winters start early. Uh, they start more, of more or less uh, at the end of August and harvest happens at the beginning of August. Um, so it's, um, um, in terms of um, flavor, uh, it's a delicate variety. Uh, I think it's a good time if you have the wines uh, to give a go to see how, how you find them. Um, it's a delicate variety. But what is interesting, uh, in this wine, there is a sort of a, a backbone, a mineral backbone. Um, so I've got I've got the wine next to me, and for those who have it there, uh, it's um, it's a light sparkling wine. So it's not a fully sparkling wine, uh, which means that the pressure in the bottle uh, it's under three at atmospheres. Um, so um, you may call it frizzante. So it's a light sparkling wine. It's been produced. Uh, produced uh, in the um, Charmat method, which means that fermentation takes place in a big vat, stainless steel vat. It is a traditional style. So in the older days, fermentation was happening in the barrels uh, and it was happening spontaneously. So people would, uh, would make wine in the usual way, press the grapes, put them in the barrel. They would start fermenting on their own. Uh, they would close the barrels and the fermentation would stop as the temperature uh, would go down as the winter was starting. So the, the wine stayed there over the winter, uh, half fermented, and then in the spring, a second fermentation would start. And if the vessel was uh, sealed, was uh, well closed, then the carbon dioxide of the second fermentation would stay in and create a light sparkling wine. And that was a traditional style in that region, believe it or not. So it's not, it's not only Champagne that um, has the privilege of having uh, traditionally uh, sparkling wines. Uh, so in, in those old days, people would use different types of grapes, uh, mostly the white grape of the region, but some red as well. But the, the final wine would be sparkling, would be light sparkling as it is now the Bina. Uh, uh, it's, um, it's pretty interesting. It is a uh, light lemon in color with fine bubbles. Uh, this, this one is off dry, so there is a little bit of sweetness and the beauty of the, and low alcohol. So we are in a cool climate there. So alcohol is, uh, is 11.8 degrees. And the beauty, uh, in my opinion, of this wine, and I would uh, chat with you afterwards, I would like to take your uh, opinions of this, is, is a good balance between the different elements. So we have a little bit of sweetness, and we have a little bit of residual sugar. We have high acidity because we're in a cool climate. We have delicate flavors of the grape, but a, a mineral backbone, which has to do with the soil. It's a, it's a limey soil, possibly with fossilic uh, deposits at uh, deeper levels. And it has this 
unmistakable um, mineral backbone, this wine. Uh, and I think all these elements, uh, the, the sort of citrus flavors, um, delicate sort of um, aromatic profile together with sweetness, together with acidity, together with the minerality, I think they create a very pleasant sort of um, uh, composition. Uh, so it's sort of, I think it's, it's very kind to the palate, uh, this, um, this wine. Um, and uh, this is from a winery, uh, more or less historic winery in the region called Domain Glinavos. It's been founded by Lefteris Glinavos on the right, the, elder, the eldest uh, of the two. On the left is uh, Thomas, his son. Uh, Lefteris Glinavos wa was one uh, of the uh, was the first uh, winemaker, Greek winemaker, that received education uh, outside Greece in Bordeaux in the 70s. Um, uh, modern winemaking in Greece started uh, towards the end of the 50s, beginning of 60s, and started in Sandorini, uh, as it was such a touristic place, and that was the renaissance of Greek wine. But uh, people basically uh, improved the way of making wine try to industrialize, try to sort of increase their volumes, but training um, was very much traditional uh, as tradition dictated. So passing basically of information from generation to generation. And it was then in the seventies and later even more in the eighties that people decided to visit um, uh, well-known winemaking areas to sort of uh, understand better uh, how when, uh, winemaking uh, can be good uh, and create uh, really nice wines. So uh, the, the winery was formed, um, uh, was founded uh, um, uh, after 1975 and they had their first bottling in 1978, which was the rosé sort of uh, counterpart part of the Debina we are testing today. It's a, again, a light sparkling rosé wine may, made predominantly by the Debina variety, 97%, uh, with a little bit of the red local variety, Beccari, which makes it very much interesting because the red variety, I explained different elements before, acidity, uh, sweetness, uh, minerality, flavors. Now we have even a red grape there that adds a little bit of tannins. And the rosé light sparkling is really, really interesting. Again, a very nice sort of dialogue between different tasting elements. Um, so it's, I think it's a very good wine, especially if it's your first wine. So being being a winery and make this making this as a first wine, I think it's a, it's it's a fantastic fee, uh, feat. And they named the wine by a local heroine, a real character, Lady Frosin. So. Nowadays, the winery uh, obviously has developed, uh, has uh, obtained uh, a very modern, uh, modern facilities, modern image, um, has a number of uh, different wines, uh, has a few sparkling uh, Debina um, labels, uh, a, a method, method Champenoise, uh, two of them, a brut and, um, and a semi, semi sweet. Uh, they make dry Debina as well, which also has a PDO status. Um, and they also use um, uh, international grape varieties in some bottlings. Um, so it's worth visiting a very different, um, perhaps, um, a side of Greece and Greek winemaking from perhaps the islands or Nemea or Nausa that you have heard of. Um, so that's the that's the wine uh, we have in today's tasting. 100% um, indigenous uh, Debina grapes and the yeasts are also indigenous. Uh, Charmat method and the fermentation is long. So they sort of try to imitate that uh, traditional wine making where where uh, when the wine used to stay in the, in the vessel, not fully fermented for the whole winter. So they harvest in August and uh, then they, they put in the tanks, the wine stays fermented, and um, the, there's a second fermentation that goes all the way to June when they bottle. 
Um, and our second stop, we will, because of having two white wines, uh, we will have to go to Sandorini and then go back to Nemea. We are not going to follow the sort of the uh, geographic geographic route. Uh, so we are going to make a stop in Sandorini. A uh, grape variety there predominantly acidic, or seventy percent of the uh, of the cultivation uh, in Sandorini. As we said, Sandorini is sort of cut on one side, on the western side, because of the volcano eruption. And this is what you can see on the picture on the left. You see this sort of sharp cliff. This is what the volcano has created. And you can see the striations of, the, of different uh, soils and rocks. Um, you can see um, that, you know, there are some white parts and further uh, in, in the horizon, you've got more black parts. Um, some areas are softer with sort of, um, uh, um, pumice, uh, sort of soft uh, stone. Other are heavier, proper lava with um, sort of metal metal content. Uh, the interesting thing, uh, if you go to Sandorini, uh, where wine is an important product uh, of the island, and I think it's, it's a surprise. People, myself, I tried to sort of went there and I looked for the vineyards and um, I thought that's not the right way of looking because I couldn't see any. You actually have to look down on the on the ground. Uh, so they don't allow the vines to train high up uh, so that they are protected from the winds. And they sort of, um, they, um, they start to spread on the soil. And when the vine grows, uh, in order to keep uh, its sort of core, um, its, its tree, uh, sort of trunk, they uh, they they make a wreath around it. They make a basket. They they allow they allow it to sort of um, go around itself and weave it, weave the branches uh, through the main uh, sort of ring circle, uh, and in that way they keep the whole sort of vine together. Sometimes, if there are strong winds, if the, if the vines are on the on the higher parts of the islands, they may dig around that. Uh, sort of wreath that that basket uh, to allow it to stay very much at uh, at um, at soil level, uh, so it doesn't doesn't rise. Very humble uh, humble uh, sort of uh, composition, uh, so it's even uh, under or just on on uh, level on on uh, um, uh, earth on ground level. Um, so and when you, you see it uh, down below how it is uh, at the beginning of the spring. This one is quite old, actually, the one at the four at the uh, forefront. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a good way to show how the trunk um, uh, sort of uh, manages to to keep everything, all the branches together. And then when when um, the spring comes, the leaves uh, sort of allow the um, the plant, the vine, to relieve. And they start the process of another cycle of life, of um, of budding and uh, and fruit bearing. Uh, but it looks like that. So the winery I've got uh, the Sandorini wine from is a is a is a local winery, the same as the first one. So all these wineries that I'm presenting today are local people. They they you know they're which is nice uh, as nice as it is obviously to have visiting uh, winemakers, but. Um, but this this is the case now for these ones. So they are locals and they have been winemaking for three generations. They used to be one of the main Vinsando producers back in the 60s. And Vinsando was very celebrated and was the main wine um, for exportation in those days. Um, so I have the new generation here, the brother and sister of the winery. I don't have the main winemaker because I couldn't find the picture. So these are my pictures, uh, but I haven't yet, yet uh, properly sort of uh, filed them. So I found, and I'm sure he's very happy uh, that I'm, I'm having uh, the young generation here. Uh, so Vagelis and Dimitra. Um, and uh, this, the, the vineyards are in the southern part of the island, uh, which is the most uh, lava, uh, lava uh, holding. Um, so the, the the wines from the southern part of the island are definitely more bold and mineral. 
They work with local varieties other than Assyrtico, that's another interesting thing, and they do very good Vinsanto. Uh, so they follow that uh, tradition of decades and they do a very good Vinsanto, uh, very concentrated, very thick, uh, very flavorsome, and yet very low in alcohol. And they have these old barrels you, you see on the, uh, on the right of the picture, the lower barrels, are the barrels of Assyrtico and they don't need to be new. They are very old, these barrels. They are 70, 80 years old. Um, they just need to hold basically the, the liquid, the wine, uh, and just allow uh, uh, air basically to uh, slowly tra uh, transform the wine. Whereas the top barrels you see on the top rack, they are new barrels and these are for maturation of their, of their red wines. And there they need the flavor, so they, they have to go for a new barrel. Uh, and I have a wine, I have selected a wine called Nicteri. It's a wine style in Sandorini. It's one of the best wine styles in, San, in Sandorini. Um, and um, very celebrated. Uh, Nicteri, the name, means uh, of the night. So the word night comes from Nix uh, or Nicta. Uh, the Greek word and means um, uh, basically what what it uh, um, uh, what it it, it is um, um, showing here is that these grapes are being harvested at night time uh, or very early hours of the morning. They are very ripe grapes, so f to make a, a wine like this, which is meant to be one of the best. You choose um, a very, you choose a very good plot, um, and you allow the grapes to ripe, well ripe, and then um, you harvest, or they harvest um, in the early hours to allow freshness. So it's a hot place, especially in the summer. Uh, with a sort of night harvest, uh, they get um, the fruit at low, the lowest possible temperatures. Uh, the fruit is, is over, over, over ripe or well ripe, uh, so you expect a high uh, alcoholic degree, a very sort of full, uh, full um, flavor. And then to enhance the flavor, they mature uh, the wine in um, barrels for at least three months. So any wine that is named Nicteri, and the, many of the producers on the island, they they want to have this sort of signature and prestigious um, label. Um, they, uh, they go for, as we said, um, a good plot, uh, ripe grapes, night harvest, and at least three months of barrel aging. Of course, this depends on the style. Uh, this one that we are having today has been aged in barrel for six months, and others may choose to, to actually age for more. So really it's a, it's a, it's a uh, winemaker's preference and sort of defines the style as well. Uh, so this is a complex uh, wine, very bold. Um, now, the one I have here uh, is uh, 13 and a half degrees, but it can vary. It can vary between 14 and a half, from 13 and a half to 14 and a half. So 14 is a quite, um, quite unexpected sort of strength, alcoholic strength, um, for this type of wine. And as I said, it is multi-layered, so, and always with a minerality that the Sandorini uh, would, would, um, uh, would create uh, because of the volcanic soil, soil and arid conditions. Um, then we have Nemia and Ayurgitico. I will come back and ask you, I want to, to go quickly on this at this stage because I want to make sure we are okay with time. Uh, but once I uh, sort of go through the Nemean uh, wine, then I will, uh, I will chat with you. So in Nemea, uh, as we said, we are back in the Peloponnese, in the mainland, on the southern part. Um, in Nemea, we have a few different, again, sub terroirs because as we said, it is a valley and expands um, uh, on the sides of a river. So we have different um, altitudes, different levels and different soil compositions. Um, so the picture on the left is from ancient Nemea and you can see there uh, Zeus temple. Uh, this is very nearby the winery uh, of which the wine we are tasting today. And a Yorgitico grape looks very much like a Mediterranean red grape. Uh, so it's a resistant uh, with 
pretty thick skins um, uh, composed um, uh, together. Uh, the, the sort of grains are composed. Um, it's a wine, it's a grape that can give wines of good alcohol, good amount of tannins, and a lot of basically red fruit, some plum as well, and cherry. So it's a very much a Mediterranean grape. And here are, is the personnel of the winery I'm showing to you again. It's a, it's a well-known, iconic uh, winery. The founder on the left, uh, he left us last, um, last summer. Uh, I think at the age of 92 or 93. Uh, his son on the right, um, George, and in the background, not clearly seen, uh, his grandson. So it's, uh, it's a sort of a, a row of, um, of winemakers um, and the barrel stacked um, uh, on the lower picture. So winemaker Thanasis Papayoano um, left um, uh, the School of Economics, uh, the Athens University, uh, because of uh, Second World War and um, had his um, studies, university studies interrupted. He came back to the home, to home, he came back home and he took over uh, the, the vineyards, the estate. And he, uh, he managed through his life to convert the estate to an organic estate before organic um, cultivation was a trend uh, 30 years ago uh, to make it self-sustained. Self so they only use grapes uh, of, uh, of their own. Um, and he was one of the first that bottled, uh, bottled wine. Uh, as we said, wine was, um, was a commodity and was produced uh, and circulated in different vessels uh, uh, without necessarily being bottled in Greece. So, and most importantly, I forgot something very important here, he was the one that took Assyrtiko out of Sandorini. So uh, lots, lots of um, achievements there. Uh, saw the potential of Assyrtiko and took Assyrtiko out of Sandorini and planted uh, Nemea, which is a predominantly red wine producing um, uh, region with Assyrtiko. And now Assyrtiko is cultivated. Everyone in Greece is such a uh, well um, behaving grape and uh, producing really amazing wines and terroir driven wines. Um, uh, so that's him. And the wine we are tasting is their estate Nemea, 100% uh, Ayurvedic from the region, uh, organically cultivated and uh, also organic at bottling, uh, good fruit selection, measured extraction, so it's not an over-the-top style. You will see the color, it's not very, very deep color. Uh, garnet, um, predominantly uh, ruby and uh, some garnet as well. And the, the wine is matured in both French and American oak uh, for 12 months. Um, so the idea there is to produce um, um, a sort of a broader style and very pleasant with different elements uh, from, from the wood. I think the beauty of this wine is that it's nicely measured. So all the main the elements, the flavor and elements, they coexist nicely with, uh, uh, without sort of uh, overshadowing one another. So it's a nice, I think, um, um, a nice example of what balance uh, can be uh, in a wine. So it's balanced, sheer and satisfying. And I think, as we said, there are about 45 wineries in the region. I think, you know, if you, if you want to do a tasting uh, of Nemean wines, I think, um, for for historic uh, reasons, um, but also for for um, for its tasting qualities, I think um, you wouldn't do bad to include uh, uh, this as well. So the photos in the presentation uh, were uh, mine, and uh, uh, and some were also from the wineries from the main Glenavos, um, and I have tried to uh, credit. Um, um, 
sort of um, pictures of um, statues uh, in the mythology part, wherever I, I took them for, uh, from, from the web. And the maps were also sourced, uh, web sourced and um, uh, available for free use. And uh, I thank you uh, to the WSET School for giving me this opportunity. Um, uh, the Greek winemakers for doing their best and exceeding and constantly elevating uh, the standard of Greek wine. Uh, Kudos Wines is an online um, uh, platform uh, and they have uh, offered this tasting pack at a very good um, uh, value price. And everyone who enjoys uh, wine and hopefully, um, you know, Greek wine will, um, will get um, a permanent place in the heart of the wine lovers um, and here is um, some connection channels for WSET which are doing a great job. Education is a very very you know a very uh, sensitive and, um, and um, community uh, sort of um, uh, serve, serving uh, so you sort of uh, create a community and you transfer knowledge, which is fantastic. Thank you very much. Let Thank me you, Maria, for that. That was um, really fascinating. I don't know if you were able to keep an eye on the chat as you were going through, but so many people clearly so interested in what you were saying. Um, I think a few people might be looking to get hold of some of those wines afterwards, uh, though your description of them has made them sound very enticing. Um, so yeah, just a, a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I think what we'll do is end the recording here.